And we give you thanks, Lord, that our hope and our trust is placed in Christ, the solid rock, the firm foundation. We look to your word now, Lord, and we pray that you soften our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. I will say it again. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, brother. If you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. Before we read this, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you tonight grateful for your word. We will not play games as a church. We will not live on what we like and disregard what we don't like. We come to you hungry tonight, needing all of your word, needing to be satisfied by what you have said. Willing to surrender our hearts to your voice. Father God, I pray that you would continually work into our hearts individually and into the life of our church. A greater and greater desire to hear your voice above all other voices. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Friends, sometimes life can feel as though it is saturated with adversity. And I thought about this for a long time this week as I read through Psalm 59, which we're about to get into. And you know, I came to this conclusion that life sometimes feels like it's constantly full of, diver of adversity for one predominant reason. Life is often full of adversity. <laughs> Profound, I know. You see, when we come to the book of Psalms, and as we've been in it for now 59 Psalms, and we've seen all of the different ways in which David has had different adversaries come against him, we get this realization that the psalmist, that the Word of God is not just a book that is about positive thinking. That is about thinking fluffy thoughts to get us through. The Bible is not littered with individuals who have on their rose-colored glasses. The Bible is full of people who take a realistic viewpoint of the world around them, but their gaze doesn't stay on the world. Their heads are always lifted to the living God. You see, God meets each one of the, it meets David and every one of the psalmists in their hour of need in differing ways, just at the right time, in the fullness of his power, to overcome the circumstances that they find themselves in for his glory and for his glory alone. And tonight's psalm, it is situated in 1 Samuel chapter 19. It is David's heart flowing out of what I'm about to read you in 1 Samuel chapter 19, starting in verse 1. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and said to his servants that they should kill David. Talk about a much bad Monday morning. <laughs> but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard against uh, guard in the morning. Say, in, stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. 
Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. And there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing a liar. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear. But he eluded Saul. So that he struck the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped that time. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him that he might kill him in the morning. But Michiel, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michiel let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. You see, friends, God specializes in providing ways of escape, of delivering his children just at the right time and according to his plan. And according to his purposes. Every time that we find David in the Psalms calling upon the name of the Lord. The Lord is always there. That's a great encouragement to you and I tonight. That every time we call upon the name of the Lord. In the middle of our brokenness. In the middle of our circumstances. The Lord is there. And he answers perfectly. In his timing. In, according to his plan and for his glory. You see, our trials, much like David's, allow us to display our absolute trust in the Lord. I don't know about you, but if the leader of your nation decided he was going to kill you, I think I would kind of go into a panic. I think that I would start devising schemes of making sure that I was protecting myself. But what I want you to see tonight is that that is not David's tactic. David leans hard into who the Lord is, trusting in the Lord with all of his might. You remember the words of James, James chapter 1, verses 2. <coughs> I'll read them to you. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. <laughs> I've heard that text read and preached so many times, and generally the introductory remarks to that particular passage will go something like this. What in the world do you mean? Count it all joy when we fall into trials and temptation. That doesn't make any sense in our lives. But friends, if you're paying attention to the Psalms, if you're saturated in how the psalmist deals with God, it is consistent throughout to count our trials as times where the grace and the mercy of God might be magnified. I mean, aren't you glad that when we come to the book of Psalms on Sunday nights, that we're not here primarily to behold the wonder of David's challenge? That we're not here to primarily and first look into all of the difficulty that faces humanity. All of that is the background of the, of the Psalms. That is certainly the difficulty of life, the difficulty of our lives, the trials that we find ourselves in are certainly the backdrop. But the focal point of the Psalms are not the struggles and the trials in and of themselves. The focal point of the Psalms is the per person and the work of God and that alone. And so as we come to Psalm 59 tonight, I think one of the things that we can lead in with understanding is that we don't have to just be stoic. David is not here finding himself in the middle of this difficulty, of this challenge, of this particular trial of a various kind, and just going, I trust in the Lord. This is not a big deal. He is crying out with everything he's he is facing a real challenge. Saul is really trying to kill him. He is really troubled. And, and friends, I think far too often we set these people up in our minds 
As here's Saul, here's David. I remember on the flannel graph, Saul kind of looks like this, and David kind of looks like that. And, you know, no big deal. I mean, here, here we go again. Saul's trying to kill David. I've heard this a thousand times. This is one of David's companions, in a sense. Jonathan's dad. Someone that I think that David probably loved. David, David respected leadership. That David <coughs> responded rightly to the king. And this king was trashing him, was treating him like garbage, was concerned more with his own reputation than caring for one who was under his authority here. And I can't imagine the emotional turmoil that David, the anxieties that David had in his heart. Now what we will see is that David trusts completely in the Lord to take care of what is coming against him. David, in fact, I believe that the purpose of this psalm, if you're not careful, I think when we come to the psalms, we can think that this is somehow David's like Twitter feed where he just kind of whines about all of the problems of life in front of God's children for the rest of the ages. That is not the purpose of Psalms. It's not to get, you know, a, a couple thousand likes and have everybody go, there, there, poor David. I mean, he wouldn't have written Psalm 51 if that was the point. That the point is of the Psalms to bring, again, magnification to the Lord, to bring glory to God, and ultimately to give you and I joy in 2018 in the middle of trials of various kinds. So if you would do honor to the reading of God's word and keep in the back of your mind 1 Samuel chapter 19 and everything that David is dealing with here, this difficult trial, and hear his words as he cries out to the Lord, deliver me from my enemies, O oh God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil. And save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O oh Lord. For no fault of mine they run and make ready. Awake! Come to meet me and see. You, Lord, God of hosts, our God of Israel, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Friends, do you notice in that that, that David is aiming that at his own nation? Our nation is not above plotting evil. Deal with it, is what he's saying. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. There they are, bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips. For who, they think, will hear us? But you, O oh Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. O oh my strength, I will watch for you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress. My God is steadfast, in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Kill them not, lest my people forget. Make them totter by your power and bring them down. O oh Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies that they utter consume them in wrath, consume them till they are no more. That they may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth. Each evening they come back, howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress, a refuge in the day of my distress. Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress. The God who shows me 
steadfast love. This is the word of the Lord. We receive it. Isn't it comforting to come and know that we have the love of the steadfast God? Here I want you to see primarily, first, David's cry in verses 1 through 5. David cries out, deliver me, God, in verses 1 and 2. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. This is not some sort of, God, I've got a little problem here. Um, you see, Saul has a big army. And, no, that's not what is happening. What is happening is David is saying, deliver me, God. They're going to kill me. He's calling out as though he was dialing 911 and, 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 and crying out for help. And I think what is most amazing, again, in verses 1 and 2, is that here, when David is faced with trouble, he doesn't go home and whine to mama. He doesn't go find a bunch of friends who will rally around him and rah-rah him and give him a high five and say, there, there, David. He doesn't do all of those things. What he does, he doesn't, he doesn't go to Ahithophel and say, hey, give me your five steps to gaining friends and influencing people. Maybe if I had those things, Saul would kind of chill out a little bit. That's not what David does here. David, with everything in him, cries out for the deliverance of God. He acknowledges at the very beginning of his struggle and his trial, God, this king who is coming against me. He is nothing more than a mere man that is in your hands. David acknowledges the sovereignty of God. Friends, every single one of the circumstances that David faces all throughout the Psalms, you get a hint of David realizing his theology, the way that he thinks about who God is, is that God is the king of kings. He is ruling over all. And if I need help, God alone is the one that I need to go. He says here, what I need to be delivered from, he names the problem. From all of my enemies and these evildoers, these bloodthirsty men, these individuals who work evil. Again, as we walked through this Psalm 58 last week, we saw that the, the primary concern for David, what, what troubles David, what troubles our world today, is the problem of sin. It is the problem of depraved men doing what depraved men do. But we're not here just left to go, oh well. We can follow David's lead and cry out to the living God knowing that he will take care of us. And in fact, that's what David continues on with. Acknowledging that God is David's defense. For behold, they lie wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine. For no fault of mine, they run and make ready, awake, come to meet me. And David says, see what they're doing to me, God? See, see how they're coming against me? Do you see the problem? See, he's saying, God, you know their hearts and you know my heart. This is not, they're not doing this. This is not deserved oppression. This is innocent suffering. Now, I, I want to take just a moment here and acknowledge something that the scriptures teach us. And that is, David is not here saying, I am perfect. He, he's not saying, I am without sin. This is Psalm 59, and we've gotten through Psalm 51. David knows his own depravity. He knows his own propensity to walk away from God. But he has a clear mind and understanding that in this particular situation, his conscience is clear. You see, a declaration of innocence doesn't always mean a declaration of complete sinlessness in the Bible. And we need to get our mind wrapped around that. Otherwise, we can really do damage to people who have genuinely been victimized. Because we will just start to paint everybody, well, you're a sinner too, so you need to get over. Now, we need to see that the Bible really does deal with situations where people are innocent of the trouble that is coming against them. And secondly, we need to recognize 
that the gift of a clean conscience is very important. Knowing that you have honored God in a particular situation is a gift from Almighty God and something to steward well, to acknowledge before the Lord. And then he says, save me from them. He cries out, he appeals to God. He doesn't, he doesn't just whine about it. God, do something here. I, I'm trusting in you. He appeals to God in verse 5 by a string of, of names. Look with me at verse 5. You, Lord God of hosts, you are the Lord of lords. Again, the sovereign king. You are God of Israel. David, Saul is king, but you are God over Saul. You are the one who can take care of this. Well, what is intense in that verse is that David, in his assessment of the problems that he faces in life, is explicitly God sent. He is not looking at the problem of, as his center focus in life. He's looking at God as the center focus, the one who can take care of the problems around him. And he says here, deliver me because of who you are, because you are the God of everything. When he says something interesting, Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Again, he is, he is here saying, God, you punish sin. Think about the contrast that's going on here. God, I am not guilty of what they are doing. You can handle the sin against me. You can handle where, where my heart is anxious and these people are coming to seek my life. God, you can handle them. And I know that my conscience is clear before you. And so David here cries out to him, cries out to God, God, deliver me. God, be my defense. And then that leads into verses 6 through 13. David's confidence. Verses 6 through 13. Now, I think that the way that David paints a picture of those who are coming against him is vividly clear. He, he, look at verse 6 with me. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They, David is saying they snarl like dogs. They, they constantly make noise. They're, they're constantly wanting something and up to something and coming against me. Verse, the first part of verse 7, they, there they are, bellowing with their mouths. They're making a lot of noise. You out words that are devoid of meaning. They scoff at God. Look at verse 7 again. With swords in their lips, what they're bellowing out is this phrase, for who, they think, will hear us. They completely ignore. Remember, he was Psalm 56. I may be off. It may be 55. Talks about the one who says in his heart, there is no God. This is just a reiteration of the same group of people who are saying, look, there's no God around to hold us accountable. We can do whatever we want to do. And we can continue to come against David. They ignore and they discount Almighty God. What we were talking about earlier this morning, I think bears repeating here. The one who knows God and David knew God well. What hurts that individual more than anything else is when people hold God in a place of contempt. When people ignore the living God. But David doesn't stop there and just bemoan that. He points it out. But then he moves into verse 8. And he, he, clearly, well, he, he clearly points at what God does with those <coughs> who ignore him. But you, O oh Lord, you laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. And what we need to remember here is that what David is not concerned with his own plight, David is concerned that evil is operating in the highest level of the nation. And, and so David is, is asking God, deal with them. Again, you hold the nations in derision. You 
laugh at those who think that they can act in such a way and completely ignore that God will hold them to account. And that's every single one of us. We need to remember that. David took seriously the problem of sin, but he trusted ultimately that God will deal with those who are sinful. And then he says in verses 9 and 10, God God alone will defend me. Look here, the first part of verse 9. Oh, my strength, I will watch for you. You are my fortress. For you, oh God, are my fortress. And then continuing in verse 10, my God in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. David gives two contrasting pictures here. One is that of a fortress. In some place where we we were down in um, San Antonio, and there is a uh, mission there. I think it was in San Jose. Sarah, what was it? Do you remember? San Jose? And and right in the corner, there's this um, bastion, this fortification that you can go in and you can kind of look in every direction. And that's kind of what... David is is describing here a fortress where he can be protected. And and that is linked to everything that's going on in David's past. What David is saying is, God, I remember you were the one who I found, I I have found protection in over and over and over in my life. Uh, uh, Look, how many times have we heard the story of David and Goliath and how David killed the great Philistine? I believe with all of my heart, if David was here to preach on that particular text, he would go, are you missing the entire point? My God defeated that giant, not me. And later on, when when David is called out to battle with the Philistines in 2 Samuel, so not only one Philistine, but an entire army, listen to what God says to him. And David inquired of the Lord, 2 Samuel, Samuel chapter 5 verses 19. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to the Alperim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of this place is called Baal Perizim. David here is delivered in the midst of battle. Again, David believes that ultimately God, he's remembering here, God is my fortress. He is the one who has actively protected me for his name's sake all the days of my life. And then he moves in verse 10 into a forward looking understanding. One is a is a picture of being defensive, of fortification, and what is past. The second, in verse 10, my God is in his steadfast love. He will meet me. God will let me look and triumph on my enemies. There is this offensive way of looking at God as God is the one who is ultimately fighting this battle for me. When, when David has Saul and all of the armies of Israel coming against him, David remembers God is the one who has won every one of my battles up to this point. And he's going to do the same thing. I trust him in that. How many things, how many trials have we been through, and we we could all give testimony tonight, were occasions where God showed that he could win our battles better than we could? How many other occasions have we found out by exercising our overabundant sinful nature that we don't win battles well. David had a few of those testimonies as well. And finally, here in David's confidence, he says God will devastate my enemies. He's not subtle about this. He says, kill them not. Let lest my people forget. The first impulse of David's heart is spare them. And not ultimately for their good, but spare them that they might be held up before the nation and for what they are. For those who are, who are slandering me, those who are evil, those who are speaking lies. Then he continues, make them to totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. 
For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride for the cursing and lies that they utter. Again, this is a psalm of imprecation. David is crying out to God to deal with those who are coming against him. Consume them in wrath. Consume them till they are no more. That they may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth. He says, spare them, scatter them. And destroy them. And what David is really speaking against here, and again, I, I know I've said this a number of times, but David is speaking against, he says it here, for the set of their mouths, for their unrighteousness, deal with them. How often do we come to people in our life that, that, that we struggle with, and it's not necessarily because they've sinned against it, we just don't like it. That's not what David's heart is. <coughs> David's heart is not petty. And self-centered. David's heart is this will the nation. And so deal with them, God. I, I leave them in your hands. And then David breaks out into kind of a weird celebration. It starts out weird anyway. Verse 14. He reiterates who these people are, what they're like. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander about for food and growl if they don't get their fill. This group of people, these foes of David, return like dogs and they roam around looking for what they can devour. You see, friends, we have to level with the reality, and I'm certain that many of us have, that the unrighteous in this life are a normal part, that they are persistent, that they continually return in different seasons of our life, at different Situations of adversity will rise up, but what we can do is, both, is just kind of get to the point where we're home about it. We've got to remember to cry out to the Lord. We've got to remember to keep God in focus, to, to constantly lean into Him as we see evil, as we see individuals who return like dogs, who roam around looking for what they can devour. And that is where David leads in verses 16 and 17. This is the crescendo. This is what we need to pay attention to more than anything else in the psalm. Listen to David's heart. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. It's amazing. David doesn't say, I will hold a 24-hour press conference and constantly complain about all of the things that these people have done. David doesn't say, I will sit around the water cooler and talk about all the problems until I'm dead. He says, my song, the thing that I will talk about, what I will boast in, what will be my joy in my life is not what's going on out there, but who reigns supreme in the heavens. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been to me a fortress. Again, that refuge. And a refuge in the day of my distress. Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress. The Lord, the, the God who shows me steadfast love, he says here, my delight, even in the middle of these trials, when the king is coming against me, when everything in society looks wrong, I will sing of your power. In verse 16, I will sing of your mercy in my life. Verse 16. I will sing of how you have been <coughs> defense over and over and over and over. What I want you to see, and some of you, 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 you probably have tuned me out already because, well, the king's not coming after you. So, I mean, I'm struggling with the application, Jay. What I want you to see is an overwhelming theme as we walk through David's words and we've heard him cry out to the Lord and we've heard him uh, declare his confidence in the king and we've heard him celebrate of the power and the mercy and the defense that he finds in God. What I want you to see overriding this entire psalm is that David, and, and I believe many other psalms, that David's trials in life move him from having anxiety about a circumstance to resting and rejoicing in the living God. You see, there's no verse in Psalm 59 where David cries out to us, just ignore your problems. 
pretend they don't exist. And just put a smile on and walk through the church on Sunday morning and be... I don't know if y'all ever had these growing up, but my, my sister read these little books all the time that had these little dot characters. And one was like Mrs. Happy-Go-Lucky or something like that. Just joy all the time. I mean, every, you know, the world could be falling down around you and everything is just great. Those people weird me out. Like, no, there are real situations in life that cause us anxiety. But there is a God who is sovereign over those situations and he doesn't allow you to experience that angst in your circumstances that, that you might be overwhelmed in them. He allows you to experience that anxiety that you might find rest in him. You see, the whole trajectory of the psalm is from anxiety to rest in Christ. And I know I've shared this with you before, but it. I would share this every Sunday twice, and I don't think that it would be ministered to heart, our hearts in its fullness the way that it should be. Anxiety speaks into our life, and whether that's angst over what's going on in your family, what's going on in our nation, whatever that looks like. And many of you right now are probably in your head thinking, I don't struggle with anxiety. Okay. Um, anxiety says two things. One is true, one's a lie. Anxiety says you are in a world that is out of your control. It's true. I think if David was here tonight, he would say, boy, that was true. I mean, Psalm 59, 1 Samuel 19, I was in a world that was absolutely out of my control. The anxiety in that truth then speaks a half lie, a, a full lie, uh, and says, and you're alone in that. You have no one to come to your rescue. You have no one to cling to in your distress. That is absolutely not true. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And again, how many times do we throw that verse at someone as, the, as an imperative of you, in your anxiety, need to straighten up and fly right and take that anxiety off and cast it on the Lord and be a good Christian. Suck it up, soldier, right? I mean, we, we've had that kind of feeling. And if we don't do it to other people, we do it to ourselves, right? Turn to Philippians chapter 4 with me. Philippians chapter 4, right there. Again, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And, and, and we, we, we throw that out so flippantly. But what we are fighting against in our trial is this belief that God is not there, that we're in the world alone and without help. Look at the very end of verse 5. And what Paul is encouraging before he even gets to the anxious part of our heart. He says simply, the Lord is at hand. God is near. In all of your brokenness, in all of your trials, in everything that you face, God is close by. He will meet you. Yes, the world is out of your control, but it's not out of God's control. And then if we back up even further, we see the imperative, let your reasonable be, reasonableness be uh, known to everyone. Well, in the middle of the trial, that can sound like that's very difficult. But it's not difficult when we know the one in whose hands we find ourselves. When God himself is protecting and working and guiding when he is our fortress and our fighter, when we know that the Lord is at hand, then not being anxious about anything sounds reasonable, right? And so then we come back to James chapter 1, verse, verse uh, 2, well, at, at the beginning, the admonishment to count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds. James says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Friends, how many times do we ask God for wisdom and then difficult circumstances show up in our life and we go, what in the world is God doing? He's giving you wisdom. But wisdom in the Christian life never comes the easy way. God loves his children too much to, than to just give them cheap wisdom, cheap grace. He gives generously and lavishly and he does it to the trials of our lives where we experience anxiety and, and, and difficulty. And we really find the bottom of wisdom is learning to turn to him. See, often we think that God somehow in our trials has missed our great plans for our lives. But what we need to remember is that his deliverance is always complete. It's always on time. And as James says, those differing trials of various kinds, we find all throughout the Psalms, leave us lacking nothing. That we would completely trust in the living God. Friends, I want to encourage you that the more bleak your circumstance, the more vicious your adversary, the more that you have reason to trust in the living God and in Him alone. Apply that to Satan who seeks to devour your soul. And the reality that Satan's schemes, though they are so lofty and they seek to destroy so much, will ultimately and finally be undone by the very hands of God. When others lie and wait for you, as they were for David, don't despair. Those individuals who are lying in wait for David were God's sovereign way of inviting David to run home to him. And I leave you with this. I think Charles Spurgeon was a man maligned. He understood the fiery darts of the wicked. He understood living in a world seeking to honor the God of heaven. Uh, where when you stand on the truth, even in the Christian church, you will be lied about. You will be hurt. Listen to Mr. Spurgeon's wisdom for us here tonight as we close. If an enemy has said anything against your character, it will not always be worthwhile to answer. Silence has both dignity and argument and uh, dignity and argument in it. All the dirt that falls upon a good man will brush off when it is dry. But let him wait until it's dry and not dirty his hands with wet mud. We need to remember in our lives that God will vindicate his children. That God will lift up his bride and his church one day for his glory. We need not do anything but cry out to him. God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Father God, you are so merciful to us. Your power and your mind to deliver us out of the hands of all of our adversaries, namely sin and Satan, is utter and complete. Your kindness to us in sending your Son to bear our punishment is altogether incomprehensible. And your defense of those who you have called to your side by grace alone is unimaginable. But we as your children here tonight in one heart cry out to you and ask that you would protect our lives that we might bring you glory, that you would vanquish our enemy that you would put to death sin that remains in us, that you would conquer everything, and that we would submit our lives to you, that all of the anxiety of a multitude of situations that I know we face together and individually in this room tonight, 
that we would see those anxieties, we would see those difficulties, we would see those circumstances for what they really are. A call to lean completely with everything that we are in a God who is merciful and true. We love you, Lord. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.